I very much uh, look forward to uh, hearing the, the presentations uh, and uh, be part of this wider framework of, of mapping uh, populism. Uh, without uh, trying to repeat what may be said later on specific countries, I would like to put an overall framework uh, we have been talking about populism for uh, quite long, uh, uh, starting with uh, studies uh, of uh, Latin American uh, left-wing populism to then uh, the right-wing populism of Western Europe in the 1980s. Uh, and uh, in the last 20 years, research has exploded on the topic as uh, similar patterns uh, and phenomena have been uh, detected uh, uh, in, in, in most uh, uh, world regions around the world. Uh, so as scholars, of course, uh, we argue a lot uh, on how do you define populism, and we do suffer um, uh, for lack of uh, conceptual clarity often and delineating the exact boundaries of, of what is populism and mm. not. And today, certainly, we will not be uh, debating uh, how each of us defines populism, uh, but I do want to uh, put some, uh, um, make some remarks on, on what has been done thus far. As of latest, uh, the various approaches has crystallized into three main uh, ways of viewing populism. Uh, the most widely uh, uh, accepted and utilized in current research is the ideational approach, uh, starting with Kasmudis' uh, thin ideology uh, concept, arguing that uh, populism uh, has something in it that makes it populist, but in, in itself is not necessarily a dominant ideology, but rather it is an ideology that is dressed uh, with uh, main ideologies from the left to the right and to the center. Uh, so, so this uh, thin ideology concept tries to get to uh, the specific uh, organization of society that populists uh, are trying to get at and uh, the role of the people and the government. Uh, the discursive style uh, is a second uh, uh, major approach in the study of populism. Uh, so even in countries uh, um, such as the US, I'm not talking about the Trump years, but even as early as the Bill Clinton years, there is uh, there is a lot of talk about populist way of talking and a populist uh, narrative and discourse and a way to re relate to voters in order to receive uh, votes. Uh, so certainly there is uh, a lot to be said about uh, uh, a populist way of talking, even if you do come from a system that is not necessarily uh, overpopulated with populist parties, or you have a party structure that certainly uh, differs from uh, uh, what we may uh, call a typical populist party. Uh, so leaders in that context can be populist even when their parties are not. Uh, then we have uh, the approach, the strategic approach uh, uh, that looks at populism as uh, a strategy, a political strategy to get to power, to get votes, to get to power. Uh, so a strategy that defines your po uh, political behavior based on a return uh, that you could uh, get uh, uh, in, in various ways, either through uh, getting the votes and getting to power or, or uh, uh, implementing policy, influencing policy, um, uh, to uh, to you know the way the way you relate with other parties within the party system. Uh, all those three approaches certainly have uh, a lot of validity in, in, in the framework and the way they look at populism, uh, despite the, the, the broad uh, differences uh, uh, that in which they look at populism. Um, so, so, you know, if we try to, to look at uh, what, what unites them is that in all three of them, we talk about the people versus the corrupt elite. Uh, whether it is uh, an, from ideological point of view or creating narratives or, or whether this is a, a strategy, there is always this portrayal of the people versus the corrupt elite and the idea that parties don't need heavy structures, that you don't need political parties necessarily as intermediaries, but rather that uh, 
uh, that politicians uh, uh, can relate directly to voters, eliminating the corrupt elite. Um, later iterations, uh, when we look at uh, uh, Takis Papas or Daniela Arbetazzi talk about anti-pluralism, uh, and illiberal democracy or anti-liberalism. Uh, so a lot of studies uh, looked at uh, the relationship uh, of populism uh, with democracy, starting with Margaret Canavan, and this has evolved a lot to say that populism is not necessarily anti-democratic. In fact, it inhabits democratic structures and benefits from democratic institutions in order to then promote anti-pluralist policy politics with the idea that the people have one voice and one desire, uh, denying uh, rights to minorities, uh, engaging in welfare chauvinism, um, uh, or in other words, uh, practicing a type of illiberal democracy, but still nevertheless democracy. And uh, being anti-liberal, uh, in a sense that uh, it denies uh, the limitations on the people's power, uh, but rather promotes uh, unlimited power to the people. So if we talk about a formulist, a formulist po uh, populist formula, uh, we can see that uh, when we talk about populism in the various countries, at least some of the following characteristics are present in the specific parties or leaders or party systems uh, that we are examining. Uh, we do see many Chian rhetoric and salvation narratives, uh, uh, whether this would be uh, Orban talking about uh, independent uh, energy and the right to liberate uh, uh, Hungary from uh, European bureaucrats, or whether we're talking about in the Bulgarian case uh, uh, of saving the country in 800 days or uh, eradicating corruption in a year uh, with NDSV and GERP, or whether we talk about uh, 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 ethnic, uh, ethnic uh, relations uh, and uh, uh, the case in North Macedonia, for example, uh, protecting the people from being overcome from Muslim Albanian minority. Uh, another big element is various anti-establishment claims. So eroding uh, the legitimacy of the judiciary, eroding the legitimacy of parliamentary institutions, parliamentary committees, and so forth, with the idea that they constrain uh, power of the people, and therefore they need to be subsumed uh, and dominated by this power of the people and serve the people as opposed to uh, be self-standing uh, uh, entities uh, pretending to uh, uh, protect democratic uh, pillars. Charismatic leadership is, is an integral part, although not all populist parties have an extremely charismatic leader. Whether we talk about Vucic or Jansa, uh, or uh, uh, Borisov, uh, uh, we, we do see some kind of personal charisma and way of talking and relating to the people uh, that, is, uh, that is very important. Now, this not, may not necessarily uh, uh, be the case. Uh, uh, Nikola Gruevsky perhaps wasn't the most uh, uh, charismatic leader, uh, but in many cases, uh, we do have charisma as an important aspect. Oftentimes, another important aspect is weak organizational structures, especially in newer parties, we see how uh, party structures uh, are too late to catch up with the electoral success and the appeal of the charismatic leader. Uh, my colleague from Bulgaria, I'm sure, will talk a lot about this with uh, uh, a mushrooming of new parties, uh, not only in recent years, but throughout Bulgaria's democratic history. Um, many, many populist parties lack this organizational uh, structure. Uh, but even when parties uh, start establishing uh, 
uh, offices at the local level and, and they do establish hierarchy, uh, those structures remain weak to the extent that oftentimes they are a function of a very strong leader. Here again, uh, we have uh, the uh, example of, of Fidesz, we have the example of Jansa or, or of Vucic, where you do have long-standing parties that are overcome uh, by a charismatic leader who starts weakening uh, check and balances uh, um, mechanisms within the party, assuming absolute, uh, absolute power. Uh, another uh, last but not least important aspect of this populist uh, formula related to the thin ideology argument uh, is the this uh, is the the platform uh, of those parties oftentimes these parties have very loose platforms that are ideologically incoherent uh, in radical right parties you see a lot of mixture of extreme left policies along with extreme right policies uh, cohabitating happily on the pages of party manifestos uh, and overall uh, those platforms may be changing uh, may be changing uh, with time, uh, often again uh, due to the political climate and the interests uh, of the day. So we do see that populist leaders and parties often tend to be feeble in their commitment to specific policies or to specific ideologies, and they could easily jump from one public enemy to another public enemy, from one issue to another, again, uh, uh, with the goal of exploiting uh, the emotions of voters and uh, maintaining their power. So what we uh, we see in in, uh, in in many of the countries uh, uh, in the Balkans is that in addition to the populism you may see uh, today in Sweden or Denmark or France, uh, in the Balkans, of course, due to our uh, history, uh, we also have the ethnic flavor, the so-called uh, uh, Balkan aspect, uh, and the fact that many of the countries uh, in the region are multi-ethnic and much more so than, in, than many of the Western counterparts. So here you also see a type of ethnic nationalism uh, that is directed towards domestic minorities as opposed to external minorities, which is the case in, in most other countries, not directed as much towards external migrants, though uh, the, such rhetoric was exploited uh, certainly during the migration uh, uh, crisis in the recent past, but still the biggest enemy uh, for those populist parties remains a domestic ethnic mm -hmm. minority. Um, so uh, another important aspect uh, um, in this Balkan as uh, in this Balkan formula is the extent to which cor corruption permeates uh, certainly the institutional structures, but also the mentality in the political uh, sphere. Uh, of course, also a function of uh, uh, democratic transition and, and, and all of that. And this is not to label. Uh, uh, the Balkans as, as, as the most corrupt place in the world, but to say that we do spend a lot of time fighting corruption, talking about corruption and, and measuring corruption, and that corruption is a very important factor in elections. So it becomes uh, an exploitable strategy for populist parties to be fighting corruption uh, and to be blaming this uh, elite as part of this uh, corruption uh, uh, to a greater extent that this may be possible in other contexts. But here also, because again of the young age of democracies, uh, uh, corruption uh, and, and populism take the aspect of clientelism as uh, Vesna Pesic uh, argues, uh, that we have uh, a type of cli clientelism where a populist ruling party, again, looking at Serbia, looking at North Macedonia, uh, maybe even Kosovo, uh, uh, my colleague will argue uh, later whether this is true or not, uh, applies that this, this party uh, becomes a vehicle uh, uh, of clientelism and uh, political actors must rely 
in uh, the specific populist party in power in order to progress. Now, in terms of uh, specific populist phenomena and parties, uh, uh, again, we would not agree on the specific categorizations that exist out there of which party is populist or not. Uh, many of them, for example, I can uh, vouch for the Bulgarian case, uh, 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 claim parties to be non-populist when many scholars consider them populist and vice versa. But we cannot argue that there's great vari variation. So if we look at a country such as Croatia, uh, where you have uh, the Hadese um, and the socialist uh, uh, alternating power with Hadese dominating, it, it may look very similar to, uh, to what you may see in, in a typical uh, Western country in the 80s, not, not today, uh, that, that maybe politics have uh, a, a, a left-right cleavage, uh, um, but, but then you see what the Hadese, the way the Hadese behaves in Bosnia, and you realize that this populism is very much present uh, and that the claims being made uh, very much fall in the category of this populist narrative. Uh, so we have uh, uh, the case of Croatia, then you move to the case of Serbia, where uh, political competition is, is sort of a, uh, uh, a footnote uh, to the power of, of Vucic and uh, uh, the uh, Srpska napredna stranka. Uh, so everything you could argue is populist, uh, is populist uh, in the country. And, and, and here we do see uh, a lot of uh, references uh, to Trump, to Putin. So many of these populist leaders do what Western populist leaders uh, uh, also do, that is to align with the anti-establishment figures and celebrate those anti-establishment figures as heroes and, and role models uh, to be imitated uh, in order to give uh, 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 sovereignty uh, to, uh, to the uh, to the specific uh, country in question. Uh, then we have uh, 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 cases such as Slovenia, Slovenia, where you have the long-term uh, legacy of uh, Janes Jansa, uh, very similar to Vucic and Orban in his pro-Putin and, and uh, 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 Trump uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, passions uh, and sympathies. Uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, being discredited, being put, uh, being convicted. Uh, so a context where there is some institutional context that can put a strain on this power. It is not a limited. Uh, he's losing elections. <laughs> uh, uh, he's not in power. Uh, so again, populism, uh, but not as much illiberal uh, democracy. Uh, uh, you have uh, the case of uh, North Macedonia, similarly, where years ago it seemed like the Mereo de Pemene uh, would, would rule forever, uh, and uh, uh, the socialists come back with a figure like Zoran Zayev, and, 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 and they do the unthinkable and what uh, has been deemed impossible, signing agreements with both Greece and, and Bulgaria, and uh, making their way on uh, a long uh, EU membership. Um, so, so again, the context is, is very different in each of these countries. Um, and, and we need to be mindful when we use uh, uh, the word populism uh, to, to make sure that this, uh, this term still holds some conceptual validity and rigor and is not simply uh, turning into a blame game of discrediting political actors and partners. I will stop here and uh, uh, allow uh, my colleagues to elaborate on each of the country cases uh, that we will be looking at. Thank you. Let me first thank you uh, for the nice invitation. I really appreciate it. I enjoy a lot to be part of this session. I have prepared a really short presentation just to try to be more focused and uh, not uh, giving a lecture as, uh, as is said, but a short, I hope, inspiring speech on the Bulgarian case of populism. So just a second to share my screen. Just give me a sign. Did you see the slides? 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Zankina. So normalization and radicalization, I named the presentation like that, the, po the paradoxes of populism in Bulgaria. Let me say that some of the conclusions in this presentation are, are based on common research work uh, with my dear colleague, Dr. Ildiko Otova. Uh, she will probably join us during the debate later, later on. And it was already published by Roglic uh, in the beginning of this year. But some of uh, the conclusions are also part of our recent work for the new book, uh, which is dedicated on populism and Bulgaria. So I will try to make um, a kind of a short conceptualization of the forms, the types, the dynamics of populist, populist actors in Bulgaria. Thanks to Professor Zankina, this, uh, my job is a bit easy because uh, you map, map not only the, uh, the Bulgarian case, but also the whole Balkans uh, quite well. But um, let me start with this, uh, that uh, one uh, thing I think should be made clear from the very beginning of my presentation. And this is, of course, a distinction between uh, populism and radical extreme right, as Professor Zankina mentioned, Papas and Mude. I have chosen to use the term populism because of its wider scope of concept, understanding it uh, in a certain degree in the sense of Laclau, empty, signifier. I understand populism in terms of articulating political practices and not, not so much as a political object or as it was written by Janssen, populism is not a thing or an object to be studied, but uh, much more a mode of a political practice. So for Bulgaria, we could, we could say that populism emerged at a late stage and uh, at the moment when democracy in Bulgaria could already be described as a consolidated, populism was uh, apparently to remain on the political scene permanently. Although one can accept on principle in the differentiation between populism and radical far-right nationalism, nativism, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, I have chosen to use uh, the populism term due exactly to its broader scope of a concept. Because the process of, I named this normalization of populism in example of Bulgaria, make this characteristic detectable with very few exception within all populist and populism infected parties into the country. Okay, so let's try to categorize or make a kind of a typology of populism in Bulgaria. Um, there are various variety of types of populism in Bulgaria. The first one is associated with several ways of anti-elitist, uh, but pro-European political projects. The center-right uh, national movement of Simeon II, um, the GERP, which is uh, the party of the former prime minister, Citizens for European Development of Bulgaria. And finally, uh, there are some pop-up projects which uh, have made their appearance in the aftermath of the protest waived in Bulgaria in 2020. The other type of populism is represented by the national populist political parties. Let's say that, I, that although in the first years after the upheaval in 1989, um, formation of this kind had graviated around two main blocks, the right wing bloc and the Bulgarian Socialist Party, which is inferior of the form of Communist Party, national populism has become an important uh, factor with the emergence of the nationalist attack in 2005. Professor Anna Kristeva, Professor Zankina knows her quite well. She also distinguished two other types of populism. She called them soft and hard populism. Soft populism in Bulgaria involves those actors that generate general appeals to the people catch all politics and demagogic discourses. The main representative of uh, the 
acts of populism are the former King Simeon and the ex prime minister Boyko Borisov, but um, also some of the newest political projects in Bulgaria, which was established exactly uh, around the protest wave fits to this description perfectly. When we are talking about the hard populism in uh, Bulgaria, um, I mean in the nationalist, extremist, xenophobic, uh, those with uh, an emphasis of othering. Uh, then we could put attack, the national patriots, the revival, which is the new star on the Bulgarian political landscape, of course, and some other nationalistic uh, formation. One of the newest distinction of the populist actors laid on the success that some of them gained thanks to the new technologies and their behavior uh, on and offline. Uh, for example, there is such a people, uh, which is the party of the XTV star Slavik Trifonov, are exceptionally active in internet and their television is uh, already streamed from many years. I have put here, but I will not stop so much on this uh, short table presenting, let's say the populist parties of the transition and some of the new, let's say new populist on the Bulgarian, on the Bulgarian uh, um, political scene. But I will uh, continue with what is the core of the presentation, which is related with the normalization of the populism in Bulgaria. Over the past decades, populists and radical actors have mobilized through electoral and protest channels and succeed in radicalization mainstream politics on the European continent and beyond, said Gatinara. So Bulgaria is not an exception of this trend, of this mega trend, let's say. Uh, there is a clear tendency of a normalization of national populism and its transformation into a norm in the political life of Bulgaria. Let me explain the mechanism of this tendency. Classic populist parties in the country, mostly from the patriotic and the populist spectrum, have been for a very long time of a marginal significance to the political life and receive comparatively, comparatively um, peripheral electoral support. But the cooperation between GERP and ATACA has opened wild the door in the subsequent years precisely for the process of mainstreaming, which has ultimately led to a complete shift of the center of the political system and to the transformation of populism into a dominant factor in Bulgaria. This practice has served on one hand to legitimize smaller and more extreme parties, such as I mentioned Ataka, but there are Venero, IOM, RO, or National Front for Salvation of Bulgaria, NFSB, by their direct inclusion into the government as a junior governmental partner. On the other hand, to ensure some kind of a stability of a government, in practice, government has come closer to the spectrum of extreme in a, a range of areas and public uh, sectors. I do work on migration a lot, so I could illustrate with uh, many examples how this function in the arena of migration policies, for example, in the recent years. I think that uh, here is um, the point to remark that a huge role in the transformation of populism into a norm was played by the media. The media and television in particular are responsible for producing quite a lot of populist leaders in Europe. Bulgaria is no exception uh, also in this uh, uh, sense. Ataka, rose the prominence on the political scene not without the help of television. Slavi Trifonov, for his own part, has been on the screen for the early 90s. Uh, what is um, characteristic about the Bulgarian case is that in the con this is in the context of a strongly dependent media environment 
through intensifying extreme discourses and providing a platform. So journalism, instead of serving as a resource and platform to combat this phenomenon and act as a protector of democratic values, in fact, provide the main accomplice in this process of normalization of populism. This is the reason why Bulgaria is the state with the most problematic media climate in the European Union for 2020. And it's still, I think, on the last place of freedom of speech in the European uh, Union. The radicalization. <clears throat> well, as a result of the long partnership and reapproachment between the patriotic and mainstream parties, both start eventually lose voter support and give way to the rise of other populist formation, some of them even more radical. This is the case of Vazraždane, the revival. Uh, in November 2021, uh, revival entered into the parliament and in the elections a year later, they were um, a month before a month, uh, it is now a fourth political force in Bulgaria by doubling its result in absolute numbers of voters. It is interesting to mention that the leader of revival has the largest presence in the social media in the country. This was clearly shown by an analysis based on the engagement on Facebook uh, platform. It is also interesting to mention uh, uh, that an analysis of a civic platform, Are You Lying? It's called Are You Lying? Um, which verifies uh, statements of politicians. They show that the party's leader, leader Konstantin Kostadinov, had the most airtime in the last election campaign compared to the leaders of the other parties. Probably you, you will not be surprised that he win in another competition also. He is a political leader that ranks first, num first place in the number of the false claims articulated in the television. So all of this is happening in a very fragile context. So the context is the ongoing political crisis in Bulgaria, but in combination with variety of other crises, health crises, COVID, uh, uh, of course, the um, war in Ukraine. So all of these were very well instrumentalized by revival and they gain uh, a lot of popularity by the way they articulate their, uh, their policies. As a result uh, of what I have described up to now, uh, the populism entry, let's say, steady into Bulgarian political life, not only through political figures, but also through policies and practices. As well, on the one, on one hand, populism enter as a transformation into a norm, but on the other hand, as a suitable ground for the rise of even more radical uh, formation. And in this situation, the representative democracy has been put into a question. There are very strong voices questioning the meaning, for example, of parliamentarism in Bulgaria. There are some moods for a regime changes, uh, change, were, for example, presidential republic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I will stop here and I will wait for the questions and presentation of the other panelists. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Evelina, for this uh, very comprehensive uh, overview uh, of the Bulgarian uh, situation. I very much agree with everything you say and uh, for uh, this uh, very original conceptualizing of mainstreaming populism, uh, uh, which at the same time becomes a normalization of politics, but also leads to radicalization. Uh, we will have the questions at the end for everyone. Uh, uh, so please take notes uh, of, of what you may want to ask Evelina. Uh, we will continue with Sorina Soare from the University of Florence, who will be talking about uh, uh, the Romanian case. Sorina, the floor is yours.
So Rina, are you unmuted? Okay, uh, sorry. Uh, so if I'm not mistaken, I'm supposed to speak for something like uh, 15 minutes to, uh, in order to leave space for the debate. So yes, 15. Um, we're a little bit behind schedule, but uh, we're not going to cut the presentation. Just take 16 minutes, uh, 15 okay. minutes. Thank you. Um, so as Evelina has said, I think that Emilia has done an excellent job for all of us because she really uh, paved the way in theoretical terms, illustrating not only the complexities behind what populism is about, but also specifying uh, the peculiarities of populism across Europe uh, and across the Balkans in particular. Um, I'm going to speak about um, um, a very recent form of uh, populism, and I'm going to speak about what happens in Romania after the 2020 election with the ways of um, a new populist, the Alliance for the uh, Union of, um, of Romanians. So um, what is the, uh, the interesting part with this, uh, this party? What is the puzzle behind? Well, we know that as, um, uh, as, it, as Emilia has said at the beginning, there is an extension, proliferation, explosion of studies on populists that correspond to the diversification of the forms of populism on, on the ground, both in uh, Western Europe and Eastern Europe and uh, Global North and uh, Global South. Um, but um, Romania looked for a while, uh, not, not, not too long, um, uh, I, would, uh, I would say, unfortunately, like, um, like a partial exception, because after uh, having been considered a, a pa paradise for populism in the 90s, um, in, um, from 2012, uh, uh, after and, um, um, a temporary um, um, presence in parliament of a party in the 2000s, 2012 legislature, there were no populist parties in parliament, and this was uh, considered to be extremely positive. However, uh, as um, illustrated by different scholars specialized on Romania, but not only, in particular, uh, Claudio Tufiš from the University of Bucharest, um, in reality, like uh, it has been um, underlined uh, uh, before, there were germs of populism uh, infiltrated in the mainstream discourse and uh, it um, demonstrating that populism was, uh, was uh, um, a living uh, species, although not, uh, presented in parliament. Everything changed in 2020 when a new party, a party that came uh, out of nowhere, or at least it looked like uh, it came out of nowhere, obtained 9.1% of um, uh, the votes and became the fourth parliamentary party in, um, in Romania. Uh, while in public debates, our was epitomized as and described as an extremist party, uh, anti-democratic uh, party, um, I think that uh, it is correct to say that there is nothing extremist uh, in uh, our uh, relation with democracy. It complies uh, perfectly with the definition of populism uh, de uh, de developed by Mude in 2004. It's a party that um, uh, uh, challenges uh, specific parts of the liberal constitutional democracy, in particular, uh, the pluralist pillar and uh, the rights of minorities in, um, in general. What makes makes uh, this party uh, part of the populist constellation of party is the emphasis on nativism. So uh, an extreme as it can be seen from the, um, uh, as it can be seen from the, um, from the, the, the name of the party, um, a party that uh, uh, is there to uh, represent the, the, the union of uh, uh, Romanian union. Um, the, the name of the party is uh, full of significance, um, not only because uh, of this reference to the Union of Romanians, and uh, for those of you familiar with the Romanian case, it is a direct uh, hint to the uh, a project of unification with the Republic of, uh, of Moldova, but it also refers, and this is the innovative part, at least uh, in, in my view and in uh, the view of the colleague Claudio Tufiš from the University of Bucharest, and part of this presentation is uh, built on a joint research that we uh, uh, 
uh, we uh, we did on on the topic. The innovative part of this uh, party is the the way uh, the party defined the demos. It is from the very beginning not a national demos but a transnational demos, uh, and the party um, uh, expre uh, expressed its form of nativism in ref uh, in reference to a multi layer definition of the people, an uh, ethnic people. Uh, first of all, of course, there are Romanians from within Romania, uh, Romanian at uh, risk of not being uh, properly represented by a cosmopolitan elite that uh, lost the touch with the Romanian, uh, Roma Romanian uh, needs, in particular in, uh, um, in cultural and values terms, but also on uh, economic and social um, issues. Uh, the second layer um, in this definition of the people um, of the people of reference are the, the so-called kin communities of Romanians, uh, in particular those uh, um, uh, communities of co-ethnics uh, from neighboring countries uh, is uh, a common element across the Balkans and Central Europe, uh, targeting communities of Romanians in Serbia, Ukraine, uh, um, Bulgaria, Hungary, and, uh, and so on. Of course, within this um, emphasis of uh, co-ethnics at risk of assimilation and discrimination in the countries of um, uh, residents, in particular in this case, it's more appropriate to speak in their homelands because they are not Romanian citizens for the most part. Um, uh, a peculiar case is the case of the Republic of Moldova because in that case particular, uh, it is not so much about uh, co-ethnics as um, a minority of Romanian in Moldova, but uh, um, in, 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 ethnic, uh, in an ethnic definition, they are supposed to be a, um, a keen majority. And I refer here explicitly to uh, Eleanor not um, brilliant analysis on the topic. And there is, last but not least, the community of uh, the Romanian emigrants, uh, those Romanian forced uh, to, to move outside Romania for the most part for economic reasons, starting with the 90s. Uh, and uh, these communities are considered at risk of being uh, discriminated in the Western countries. So what our did from the very beginning, and this was an innovation, he presented itself as the representative of this transnational people a people that goes beyond the boundaries of the Romanian uh, uh, Romanian uh, uh, Romanian state. It is, however, a partial innovation if one takes into account a broader area of reference. It is, for example, quite common, and it was quite common for uh, it is quite common for Ecre in the Eston Estonian case. In the case of Fides, there were elements that also demonstrated that after a certain um, hesitance to, to deal with the communities um, uh, of um, the labor communities, uh, the labor migrants, um, uh, Fides uh, increasingly uh, di uh, established a dialogue with these communities also. In, it, it is quite common in Latin America, and I uh, quote here, uh, Apais, Ecuadorian Apais. And I, um, in case you are interested, there is a very beautiful um, uh, paper uh, recently Recently published by Jakobson et al. On, on, on the topic. So there is, uh, there are um, empirical uh, evidence, uh, there is empirical evidence showing that uh, the populist constellation of parties has somehow uh, redefined the people of reference. It's not so much the people within the frontiers, but the people in, uh, in general. However, in this presentation, I'm less interested in defining what are the reasons behind and the elements of that characterize each, each layer in this definition and to look more in what was the relevance of this definition of the party in the 2020 mobilization and beyond. Why we thought that it, it was interesting? Because from the very beginning, part of the success our registered in the 2020 elections work uh, was connected explicitly with a very good um, uh, electoral mobilization abroad in the communities uh, of Romanians in uh, Western Europe, Italy, and Spain, um, uh, mainly, but not only, Germany, Belgium, Austria and uh, and so on, and um, together with Claudio, we uh, we realized that it, um, it it might have um, a possible explanation might be connected to um, a relation between um, uh, those uh, territories in Romania uh, characterized by a high rate of migration and. Uh, uh, voting uh, voting abroad. And indeed, if we test, although the, the, this kind of uh, correlation are somehow superficial because we, um, uh, we 
do not have enough element in particular in order to control our correlation. Um, we can see that uh, in particular with uh, Italy and Spain, there is um, a moderate uh, to strong overlap, uh, suggesting that migrants network might have amplified the potential of, of uh, voting our head at the national level. So what was interesting in our idea was not so much that our scored a lot abroad, but most probably that our um, represented a trigger for the mobilization in Romania. Why so? Because our was practically absent in uh, the Romanian political debates uh, over the 2020. It was practically invisible in the campaign um, uh, before the legislative election in 2020. And however, it succeeded and uh, did rather well both in Romania and, um, and abroad. So uh, how was it possible? And um, with Claudio, we are working on a research um, uh, on the topic, and we think it's interesting to look at the party origin. And among the elements that we have identified as extremely significant, and, uh, are the institutional origins. And from the very beginning, the, uh, the Congresses the party organized in uh, 2000, uh, 2020 and uh, in uh, more recently in 2022, uh, um, these Congresses um, uh, gave a lot of space to uh, the communities of Romania abroad and were organized simultaneously or uh, became the, um, uh, the, the um, uh, trampoline for uh, the organization of similar congresses abroad. And um, organized, the party was officially registered in September 2019. And on the eve of the, the election, according to our research, uh, there were already 22 functional uh, national uh, organizational um, um, uh, branches uh, um, in uh, 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 abroad. So uh, the party was rather well, uh, uh, well represented uh, abroad. But we also knew, and it was um, it was rather obvious in um, in um, the the brilliant uh, talks that uh, you heard before me um, that um, leaders are really. Uh, really interesting in dealing with populism. And we wanted to look at exactly what leaders um, had to tell us with regard to this peculiarity, this connection between a transnational demos and an extremely well-developed organization abroad. And um, we looked uh, at the party leaders uh, at the, for a while from 2019 until 2022, uh, the party had two leaders, so a dual, uh, a dual leadership. Uh, and what was interesting in our, in our reconstruction uh, is the fact that um, uh, far from being a personal party, uh, our from the beginning valorized an extremely diversified and rooted network of uh, socialism forms of association, the leaders brought into the party. Uh, just to, uh, to give an example, in particular with regard to George Simeon, one of the, um, uh, and uh, the, the current leader of the party, in 2002, the party uh, dropped the, the dual leadership and adopted a traditional um, monocratic leadership. So George Simeon was particularly well known on the ground for his forms of uh, socialism uh, with regard to uh, cultural aspects, uh, the defense of the Romanian culture, unionism. And he was particularly active uh, among uh, forms of uh, supporter, uh, football supporters uh, associations. Uh, he uh, was part of the national uh, in environmentalists that uh, uh, developed as a by-effect of the, um, uh, the famous Rocha Montana uh, case and a form of um, um, uh, protest against uh, uh, against uh, uh, authorities and it was also um, part of um, uh, of an active uh, uh, investment with regard to co-ethnics in uh, in Romania what we did that Thank you. What we did with um, with Claudio, we said, okay, how is it possible to connect this uh, these two elements, broad diffusion abroad and uh, uh, broad roots, associational roots in uh, Romania? We uh, started a, a rather long um, uh, pass of interviews, semi-structured interviews with uh, um, with uh, supporters and members of our abroad. And the first element that we noticed, first of all, was the lack of marginality and radicality. 
So those people are normal people to, to say in, um, uh, in a certain way, people that were somehow uh, particularly interested in what happened in Romania and they saw, they think that our is their last chance to save uh, Romania. But what they, uh, what motivated them to join our is not so much uh, or not only um, uh, um, common values with our in terms of tradition, family, uh, defense of the cultural uh, um, uh, values and so on. It was most importantly pre-established uh, forms of connection with exactly the forms of associations that uh, both Claudio Torzio and George Simeon had on the ground for over 10, uh, 10 years. So these people knew themselves uh, uh, among themselves uh, because of these forms of association associationism. What is the final uh, conclusion? And um, in, our, in, in our understanding, it represents a nice uh, contribution to the literature. Uh, it shows that there is space in the literature on populism for talking about a transnational form of populism, a form of populism that conceals the differences between the ethnic people, the majority of the Romanians from within the state, in our case, and those uh, communities of co-ethnics that voluntarily of or uh, involuntarily were um, uh, find themselves outside these uh, borders. Thank you very much. And I hope I was not too long. Thank you. Thank you, Surin. I know you were perfect and, and you're making a, a very interesting uh, observation that I would like to note. We do see this phenomenon uh, uh, in, in more than one country in the region where uh, populist radical right parties are appealing to a diaspora in Western Europe, uh, in the US, uh, where you have, uh, of course, a sizable population, not enough to, uh, to help you win elections, but certainly enough to pay uh, uh, past the threshold in some cases. Uh, so you do see in, in, uh, in several cases, uh, the diaspora being uh, uh, mobilized along nationalist lines, which I think is a very interesting phenomenon, given that you're talking about people who have purposely chosen uh, internationalization in terms of their identity, uh, living outside of the country, uh, but playing on this nostalgia and a core identity, again, appealing uh, emotionally. Uh, moving on, uh, we have uh, uh, Nejma Jananovic uh, Mirashchia uh, from the University of Sarajevo, who will be uh, talking about uh, the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, Nejma, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the goal of my uh, today's contribution is to present the trends of the radical right in Bosnia and Herzegovina and to try to provide the analytical axis uh, along which the radical right populism in Bosnia and Herzegovina could be reviewed, uh, but also uh, uh, compared to similar trends in the region to which it is closely tied, uh, but also uh, across Europe. And in that sense, uh, I will touch upon some of the repetitive, but also some of the very authentic uh, narratives that are um, present among uh, radical groups in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, in order to do so, um, it is of um, utmost importance to understand the political environment and uh, the populism of the mainstream in Bosnia and Herzegovina, its, its content. Uh, and the fact that it is ethnic populism, uh, which unfortunately normalizes the hate speech uh, and the extreme right content in political life in Bosnia and Herzegovina on everyday basis. Uh, also, I will try to touch upon uh, the both horizontal and vertical um, concepts of populism, which appear, and the position of the extreme right uh, uh, actors in, in, in that framework. Uh, this contribution, I have to say, is um, based on a few research pieces that were conducted since 2016 uh, that look into the populist content and type of communication used by actors, uh, including some of uh, the pioneer work, uh, but also uh, in addition to the insight into the far right actors, um, uh, which is provided through the findings of uh, security queries and security research, uh, as the phenomenon of the extreme right in Bosnia and Herzegovina is mostly tackled um, uh, through security parameters uh, and uh, 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 
observed as a security issue rather than a political issue. Uh, so it is my hope that uh, with this contribution, um, um, it, I may contribute to the incorporation of the far right research uh, into political science field and, and, and not just the security. Um, so the populism did not uh, skip Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, moreover, uh, it is omnipresent and it's been one of uh, the major features of our political life uh, for the past three decades. And even a very superficial, um, uh, superficial analysis of this phenomenon or the rhetorics in Bosnia and Herzegovina shows that it is populism um, uh, which heavily leans on nationalistic ideology. And in case in Bosnia and Herzegovina, it is more accurate to claim that it is a variation of populism uh, that contains other features as well, uh, but that is best uh, that it best fits the model of ethnic populism as uh, Laclau uh, defined it. Uh, a deeper analysis uh, of the phenomenon and of the content suggests that it cannot be detached uh, from ethnic national nationalisms. Uh, that the region of former Yugoslavia has uh, been witnessing for the past three decades. Uh, so it is uh, older uh, than, than uh, the latest wave of populism throughout Europe, and it is also, uh, it is also regional. Um, um, in the most recent years, uh, however, it reached its full identification as ethnic populism, uh, articulation and visibility due to the rise and strengthening of the populism uh, in European and world politics, and the, the actualization of this phenomenon in the academic discussions, media, public space in the society. So we dealt with it as a nationalism or ethnic nationalism, not necessarily calling it uh, populism or ethnic populism. So before embarking on, on uh, the central analysis, I also need to reiterate the fact that the populist phenomenon in Bosnia and Herzegovina is somewhat specific uh, compared to more general trends, considering the recent turbulent history and the political, economic, and social context of uh, our democratic transition. Uh, it significantly um, falls within the theoretical framework and contemporary interpretations of populism uh, as ideology, but also as a discourse and as a rhetoric. So it's, it's present in, in all these three shapes. Um, the populist features uh, are also present in political mainstream, not only during election campaigns, but also in everyday messages of uh, political leaders. At the same time, uh, even the term populism uh, has become popular. Uh, or more popular in the common speech and uh, different political actors often um, accuse uh, each other of, uh, of, being, uh, of being too populist. Uh, the key definition probably of uh, the specific uh, ethno-nationalist uh, form of populism is, is given by uh, Asi Mojkic, and let me just uh, uh, um, briefly um, um, quote him. Some kind of a melt, he calls it uh, some kind of a melting pot of various bits and pieces of political doctrines and principles. Socialism, liberal democracy, fascism, romantic nationalism, religious nationalism, but also a melting pot of various cultural pieces, historical narratives, mythologies, literature, religion, tradition, or other events that are considered of vital importance to the identity of one particular ethnic group. Unlike most other political doctrines, ethnopolitics as non-doctrine has no other goal or vision or eschatology, but to remain in power. Its raison d'etre is crisis, appeal to constant existential danger of a particular group. Permanent condition of endangerment is the only effective way to remain in power. So uh, that's, that's what Mojkic says. Um, uh, to add to that, I have to say that fear mongering and manipulating with the feeling of permanent endanger endangerment is a backbone of political Bosnian political life and the main platform of three ruling ethno nationalist blocs. And doing so in a post conflict country with very recent experience of brutal violence is beyond what can be described as toxic and beyond. Uh, just being a threat to democratic uh, to democratic development. 
So owing additionally to, 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 to the discriminatory constitutional provisions that deepen the ethnic uh, divisions within the country, the political decision-making exclusively depends on uh, agreement between the ethno-national political elites and the representative, uh, representatives of the three constituent people. So it is very important to understand the distinct features of uh, populism in Western Europe and the ethno-national populism in the context of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Instead of um, a vertical division between us, people, common man, uh, and them, the elite, the establishment, uh, um, the political elites skillfully uh, transformed populism and placed it primarily into horizontal antagonism between us, people and common men together with our political elite. So we are one with, the, with, the, uh, with our elite. And then the other people, the other common men of other, uh, 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 with their political elite of, of, of different ethnic, uh, ethnic background. So the novelty in, in some of the recent uh, political uh, campaigns is that some of the parties uh, at the right spectrum introduced uh, this missing vertical antagonism into their rhetoric and their populism um, means taking the side of the disenfranchised groups, but of the disenfranchised groups uh, of their own ethnicity. Uh, the populism of these right-wing parties that are in the opposition is, is very often propagandist, equally nationalistic, but based on the requests for uh, justice, the fall of the regime, the fight against corruption, moral purity, and, uh, and so on. And uh, uh, depending, um, uh, depending on the level of government in which a certain party holds power, it is not unusual in Bosnia and Herzegovina that you have the fight between two populism, one populism fighting, fighting the other. Uh, if it's vertical, then it takes place within one uh, ethnic uh, political political uh, block. So uh, now on the trend in in, in radical right, and uh, probably I will somewhere have to um, have to stop because I, I didn't really finalize uh, uh, my my um, presentation, and as there is just uh, too many elements that I wanted to share. Uh, the distinction uh, between the right nationalist mainstream in Bosnia and Herzegovina and extreme right is very thin. Uh, with, uh, 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 with some actors uh, that I will uh, probably later mention, um, the, the distinction is virtually non-existent. Extreme right actors still mostly operate under the authority of the leading ethnic nationalist party parties as their hawks or where they are formally separate in close coordination as the mainstream right political parties can provide uh, financial support, often through public funding. Uh, the groups that are separate from the political mainstream parties um, have certain difficulties, uh, financial difficulties. Uh, some of them, although registered as political parties, do not even run. Uh, so that is one of uh, the indicators uh, of, of, of their relations uh, to mainstream parties. Uh, those uh, who are not related to the mainstream parties and um, who seek to be um, authentic, uh, they, they are the ones who often do not take part in, in the elections because they do not have money to run campaign or, or even, or even to, to register. Uh, another point where uh, the extreme right and mainstream meet is the fact that for the last three decades, Politicians and policymakers in Bosnia and Herzegovina have rather transparently manifested their nationalism uh, in hate speech and bigotry, targeting the outgroups and re in reinforcing the victimization narrative of, uh, of the in-groups. So some of what uh, political and military actors have said in this vein uh, has proven to be a later inspiration for uh, uh, international far-right far terrorism, and I think particularly of uh, Anders Breivik and, and, and Brenton Tarrant, the, Tarrant, the attacker in, in, in the Christchurch um, across the globe in, 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 in New Zealand. Uh, 
Um, so the, the, the far right extremism in Bosnia and Herzegovina has, uh, has had its uh, international, international influence. It is clear that the far right extremism uh, we see today in the region, but in Bosnia and Herzegovina extends uh, not just from the 90s uh, and not just from, from the war and atrocities in the 90s, but also from the late 80s when the former Yugoslavia began a process of uh, democratization and liberalization. And uh, the wars that followed in the 90s actually were the catalyst for these uh, far right ideologies. In that sense, it is very interesting uh, to follow the example and the political evolution uh, and also the international position of Serbia uh, in the 90s, but also later because uh, it is, uh, it is the, 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 the wartime, um, uh, uh, not, just, uh, not just the rhetorics within Serbia, but also its international position, the sanctions and the isolation that actually normalized uh, xenophobic uh, um, and, and, and nationalistic rhetoric, uh, anti-Western rhetoric, uh, pro-Russian uh, pro uh, propaganda, which is uh, a part of uh, the far-right uh, agenda today, not only in Serbia, but also in parts of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, further, Bosnia and Herzegovina faces a rather paradoxical situation uh, where the, um, as I said, the official far-right organizations are very small, marginal, almost invisible, uh, but their far-right ideas uh, feature prominently and they are present in the discourse of the mainstream political parties. So in other words, we do not have uh, right -wing, uh, far right parties uh, in Bosnian parliament or on uh, uh, entity or regional, regional level assemblies. Uh, very few parties uh, of, of, of uh, far right um, had uh, a few mandates in, 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 in these um, uh, 30 years. Uh, but uh, the, 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 uh, the, the propaganda of, of the ruling political parties, the political content um, uh, actually takes, uh, 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 um, is taken uh, from, uh, from the far right, from the far right groups. Uh, and it is not only the hate speech, uh, it is uh, pretty much uh, the, entire, uh, the entire political agenda, the ideology, uh, and also uh, not related uh, only to the war, uh, to the war in, the, in the 90s, uh, but uh, uh, very present, uh, especially among Serb and, and, and Croat nationalist parties, uh, the revisionist perspectives, uh, of the Second World War. So some of the groups are very much tied to, to, to the ideologies and, and the glorification of, um, of the different um, uh, collaborationist uh, pro-Nazi movements in, uh, from, from, the second, uh, from the Second World War. One minute, okay. Um, so um, what I wanted to say is that uh, the major, uh, uh, um, the major uh, danger of uh, far right parties um, and um, and their uh, um, and their uh, narrative uh, should not be underestimated. The fact that they are marginalized uh, and that they um, almost do not participate directly in the political life does not mean that they do not have a considerable influence uh, on the ethno nationalist parties that dominate the political life and that unfortunately normalize both the hate speech, uh, but also uh, uh, the, the, the radical, the radical uh, far, far right rhetoric. The conservative uh, patriarchal discourse that is prevalent in Bosnian society and politics also underpins uh, their ideologies and narratives uh, and makes uh, the far right agenda, again, part of, uh, part of uh, the media and uh, political political um, discourse. So uh, that's it for me for now, and I look forward to your to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Najma. Very very interesting and thorough analysis. Uh, a couple of points to highlight. Really interesting idea of the securitization of. Uh, the rhetoric, uh, as well as the take on ethno-populism with the 
horizontal antagonism and the vertical antagonism, particularly interesting, the vertical within ethnic group antagonism. So plenty to discuss. Thank you so much for an excellent uh, presentation. We're moving uh, to our uh, uh, last but not least presentation uh, uh, today uh, before uh, uh, the, our discussion. We have uh, uh, Avdi Ismailai uh, from uh, the Epoca University in Tirana who will be examining the case of Kosovo. Avdi, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Emilia. Thanks a lot for inviting me to the panel uh, to present here the case of uh, populism in Kosovo. When I was hearing to the presentation of Serena uh, mentioning diaspora, to my mind it came the day of election in Kosovo <laughs> when the, we were flooded with cars, with buses, with planes of people coming to save Kosovo. So they, they it was it was a discourse that if we uh, elect this party, then we are going to save. It's, 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 we have found our savior. Then the diaspora was very much mobilized to come and to vote with whatever means they could come on hope. Think that uh, we found the solution. We found the, the one who actually would save us and would save the country. Up to this level really has gone the, if I may, if I may use the word, the ignorance of electoral behavior, uh, hoping that uh, it's, the, the country can actually be saved by, by one guy or, or by one political party. I will come back to this. So the case of uh, populism in Kosovo is quite clear now, uh, regardless of uh, theoretical disputes of what actually populism might be and taking into account of not putting everything into uh, something which can be named as populists. The case of Edvendosia, the party, political party, which now is in power, which in English means self-determination, uh, led by uh, Albin Kurti, who is now the prime minister, uh, represents a clear case of uh, hard populism. The soft populist behavior can be found also in other political parties taking into account that uh, most of the leaders of political parties, they did not have much information on the democratic process as we did not have previously. An experience with democratic tradition, probably due to the immaturity in politics. So in all political parties, one could find a sort of, a sort of big promises, big words, blaming each other, trying to polarize society and so on, but none of them uh, represented uh, a case of a party which actually can be uh, easily considered as an anti-establishment party. And I would like a bit to start chronologically how they came to power is quite interesting because the party started as a sort of a, a civic activism in 2004, 2005, uh, later on, but mostly at the substance of the, the ideology of, of this uh, movement, because even now they somehow, uh, they don't want to call themselves as party. They, they want to, to call themselves as being a sort of a movement with people on the side of people and so on. But at the substance of the ideology stands uh, ethno-nationalism. If one sees the manifesto of the party with two, three pages of manifesto, two third of, the, of this uh, manifesto is about history of, uh, of uh, Albanians, of Albanians in Kosovo and so on. So it's mostly relying on the ethno-nationalism. And among the main objectives that made the party to be uh, anti-establishment is the objectives of uh, initially uniting Kosovo with Albania. This is what made them to be against even the establishment of the state of Kosovo, which is established. Another point is that taking into account the heavy role of international community, which we like it or not, this was, it seems necessary, the price we need to pay in order to create the state and to get the independence, uh, consistently is uh, considered another point within the anti-establishment a party being against also the symbols of the state, against the 
the hymn of the state against the flag, always aiming that uh, uh, Kosovo should be part of, uh, of uh, uh, Albania. But uh, with such a cause, actually, they could never get a massive appeal. So what they did, like, even they were against elections, saying that those uh, are are fake elections, so we should not participate. They started quite late to participate in election in 2007 first, then later on, but they could not actually gain much, uh, much, of, the, uh, much of the votes. And uh, later on, actually, they could probably get around 11, 12% of the votes, uh, expanding their cause. And this is uh, where they actually expanded to what they by anti-establishment meant was dividing society into two, the old regime and the new regime. The old regime would constitute the all previous parties who ruled until to, uh, 2021. And the new regime would be considered the regime which is now since uh, 2021 when the party uh, started to, started to uh, rule. So actually, they expanded this. They actually counted a bit of arrogance of former political parties who went to extremes with the corruption, with nepotism, with clientelism, uh, actually mobilizing unhappiness of people, dissatisfaction of people. Then uh, taking into account also that the leader of Vedvan Dosia, who is now the prime minister, somehow tried to present to the public as a pure guy as coming from outside, not insider in the vocabulary of populism, but as an outsider, the guy who somehow uh, rejected to be part of the establishment, uh, not corrupted, uh, uh, strong guy, not the guy who does compromises, and somehow uh, adding to the cause, to the ethno-nationalist cause, the fight against corruption, the, fans, the fight against the as uh, one of the famous uh, frame which was used in the in the uh, election campaign was state capture, so fighting the state capture by other parties. And it's interesting. I will I will mention this later. That now what they are doing, they are doing the same, but they are they are capturing the state by themselves. And in this way, actually, they created a cause, they mobilized the masses. And I think uh, the other political parties, they, they were quite comfortable because also they counted on a, a party system and the electoral system. They counted on a multi-party system, which probably would not allow one party to win. And electoral system, which is a proportional system, they counted on the distribution of votes with a single electoral zone across the country, they never thought that one party would be able to defeat all other uh, traditional parties, if I can call them traditional, but those are the first parties who uh, set pluralism at the stage, probably some living 30, some around 20 years, and, but this is our experience with, with democracy. And in this way, he managed even to mobilize diaspora, which is a very much uh, impactful because diaspora is considered one of the main contributors to the economy of the country. So they made use of these family links. And I think most of this financial contribution is not based on national or ethnic lines, but is based mostly on family lines because family still continues to be a very strong institution in a, because we still are quite a considerable traditional society then creating a cause that this is the guy who would save the country. We have found the hero and actually mobilized. If you mobilize the diaspora, it means you have mobilized families inside the country as well. Try to mobilize the youth because the leader of Vendosia also somehow um, represents not very young, but quite a young population. And uh, this is the way how he managed to create this populist cause and to win more than 50%. Initially, in the first election, he won more than 30% that they needed a coalition with another party, but they needed them to make a coalition with a party of an old regime. It was not easy to, to sell it to the public, but still they say, yes, this is for the good of the country, and it was quite acceptable. But it did not take 
uh, many months and the coalition was broken because it seems this party in its own behavior as a governing behavior would have difficulty to rule with other parties. Unless you have inside a party which is very submissive uh, to you. Now there is a case of a split of a group of uh, people who split from LDK, one of the Democratic League of Kosovo who split uh, uh, from them, probably also on the cause of being unhappy, but uh, this is not very easily justifiable because they were insiders. They are the guys who benefited out of this clientelist and this uh, uh, corruptive structures of the country, but they managed to escape with few people and they joined together even in election. And probably I would not count them as a party initially because in the electoral polls pre-election, they got just probably around 1% and they were afraid because the electoral threshold is 5%. So they just a group of people who joined the electoral list of Vedvendosia. And uh, after, after they, they got the, 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 to power, they managed to make, even now the president comes from this group of people who uh, escaped from the LDK. Now one of them started to go back again. It's a new development. But what, what is an important case here is that Kosovo represents a new democracy, is a young democracy, not yet established democracy. And the point is that uh, taking into account also the electoral behavior of masses, who I would freely say that there is a quite uh, passive authoritarian behavior among the masses. They are very much linked with the current authoritarian behavior of the Vedvendosia leader and the prime minister. Then in this way, the establishment, they have challenged, for example, saying that there is a state capture. Yes, this was true that in most of the boards of the companies, in most of the institutions, public administration, one could see guys from other parties, other relatives or party supporters and so on. And in this way now, uh, this iliberal, uh, practice of the current government is actually just doing the same what they have done as Müller uh, on his studies on populism uses the word of colonizing institutions. Now this is what the current government is doing, putting its own people saying that we need to work with people with trust because the people who are there are the people of others. They are members on the boards of, of companies from other parties. We need to, to uh, fire them. And this is what they are actually doing in most of the, most of the electoral uh, boards. Uh, they have also gone on with nepotism. There are many cases of family members of people close to the leader who were placed in institutions and so on. But still, the prime minister is saying that you cannot find a single case that I myself I put any of my family members somewhere, but at the end of the day, those people who are pursuing these nepotist practices are people who were appointed by prime minister uh, itself. And in this way, then actually they are not uh, providing a good alternative to these weak institutions, weak rule of law and weak constitutional structure uh, in Kosovo, but they are actually Actually, just replacing what they have done uh, previously and also trying somehow to have a justification because and one of the, the, the biggest difference from the, uh, the uh, new and the old regime as they are, they are conceptualizing it is that their governing is very weak. There is a very high level of, of uh, uh, money which were not used. No construction companies is working. Um, it is said that there is an intention of government to make former companies who got contracts in a clientelist way to bankrupt them. But there are about two years in government, no roads was built, no schools was built, no hospital was built. Actually, it was done nothing. But now there is a justification of current government saying that for 20 years, the old regime has done very bad and there is no way of moving forward because this doesn't seem true. This is a very uh, generalization. This is very, very populist because of course we are aware of, of the, the weaknesses during the previous governments, but 
at the end of the day, we can't say that they haven't done anything because they have created a state. We, had, we did not have state before. So now we have the state, someone has created it. And those institutions, although not much functional, someone has established that. But in this way, is trying to find a justification for not doing anything. It seems in this period is not doing anything as is trying to get everything under the control. Then after getting all the things under the control, then probably he would start to give contracts to, to the companies he, he favors or the party. But when we say he or the party, we should know that in the, our political context, uh, the leader means the party and the party means the leader. This is not only the case in Red Vendosia, but with all other parties. Probably this, yeah, probably this is also due to the electoral behavior and the lack of uh, experience with pluralism and parties and democracy and, uh, and so on. And so far, this seems to be the, the reality, the ongoing. It's very interesting to, to observe the later development. But so far, this is the experience. And it seems like populist parties, which somehow come into power with the aim of bringing something good to democracy and liberal democracy. Uh, in case of Kosovo, this doesn't seem to be the case. People have already started a bit to be uh, a bit disappointed, but still using justification. Now the government is using the live stream videos of bringing old picture of the old leaders, what they have done to the country as a way of trying to substitute of uh, a lack of doing anything during these two years in a, in a uh, government. There are many other things to be said. I try to uh, generalize, to summarize those developments and uh, I would be happy if there are questions, specific questions uh, uh, to this. Thank you very much, Abdi. Very interesting uh, uh, account of the Kosovo case uh, with a lot of uh, common themes that we see from uh, what we outlined thus far. Uh, the new party, the outsider to politics, uh, the anti-corruption and anti-establishment uh, uh, claims, the personalist aspect of the party, uh, and all of this within the uh, framework of uh, ethno-nationalism. Uh, mobilizing the diaspora, again, a trend, a trend we have heard about today, and the idea of uh, greater Albania resonating with greater Romania, with greater Bulgaria, mm -hmm. with greater North Macedonia. Uh, again, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a region of greatness, right? <laughs> if if, if maybe, maybe in the question part, but now there seems to be a change in this attitude. Yeah because of, as, as it was said by, by the prime minister itself, he said the direct question, what he's, whether he still thinks of this unification, he said that if a referendum is organized, I would vote in favor. But imagine the difference between promoting an idea yeah. or even challenging the state to the idea of very passive attitude. If a referendum organized, I would vote in favor of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, we have about 20 minutes uh, to go to questions uh, uh, from the uh, uh, from the audience. Uh, please uh, uh, raise your hand or uh, type a question in the chat. If you have one. Uh, yes, uh, Bulent. Yes, thank you very much. My question is to Dr. Soave. Uh, I know that uh, she has no much time. Maybe she can answer it. Uh, we know that uh, despite presence of uh, populist politics in Romania, the populist parties in this country have not replicated uh, the success of political parties elsewhere in Europe. Rather than following the mainstream populist policies, uh, such as anti-immigration, xenophobia, and protection, protectionism, Populism in this country largely revolves around long-term extortions uh, with institutional corruptions, bribery, and abuse of power by the establishment or ruling elite. Observers show as the first and foremost uh, reason for that is the mainstream parties such as the Social Democratic Party, PSD, and the National Liberal Party, PNL, 
incorporated populist rhetoric into their own politics. Uh, Dr. Suarez, does not this mean that populism is a part of mainstream Romanian politics? Uh, what is your analysis? There is maybe new parties representing populism, but the mainstream parties also has some assets uh, we could uh, easily define as populism. Thank you, Bulen. Surina, yes, please. Thank you, and I do apologize because I can't stay for uh, for longer. And I really enjoyed all the presentation. I am um, so I, I try to be rather quick. I fully I fully agree with your analysis. I think that we may say that there is something rotten in Romanian democracy because um, th th there is definitely a lot of. Uh, populism um, uh, affinity with uh, mainstream party discourses. And it was rather obvious in the way these parties positioned themselves at the very beginning in particular uh, with regard to a theme that somehow uh, uh, was um, uh, a quintessence of populism, the referendum on the redefinition of family that were organized in, uh, in, uh, in Romania, a redefinition in a traditionalist way, uh, like um, in line with the wedding between uh, a man and a wife, uh, a man and a woman, uh, eliminating uh, all other forms of um, of unions. And these two parties, they align themselves. Uh, they align on uh, very traditional values, conservative values. So yes, you are fully, uh, full, fully right. And um, but I think that in our case, while in the other uh, parties, the fact that they are member of uh, European groups which uh, represent the mainstream politics, there are still forms of controlling their uh, their behavior uh, from time to time while in our case the discourse is more vocal also because it's in the opposition it does not have a, um, a, a representative in the european parliament so it's easier to be uh, i would say disloyal to uh, norms political norms while all the other parties can't can't afford to be disloyal because they are part of uh, of the system but i fully agree with you populist is part of the Romanian politics. Thank you. And Thank I apologize, but I will have to leave. Thank you once again. And um, I hope to be able to meet you again in another conference and hopefully in presence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Serena. Uh, yes, we have uh, a follow-up question. Uh, no? OK, no. Uh, if I may pose a question. Um, to can we can we yes uh, if i can pose a question uh we talked a lot about specific parties and and when we uh study populism parties really represent the uh, supply side uh so we're looking from the supply side uh, but certainly uh the supply side uh, is connected to the demand side on in other uh, terms to the voters uh, so if we could start with Evelina, with uh, any thoughts you may have on the voter aspect, why is it that voters give in uh, to Kostadin Kostadinov? Why would somebody in London <laughs> vote for him, which is actually very common? Um, uh, why is it that, uh, that voters uh, um, uh, support uh, ethnic uh, nationalism uh, is it only identity or, or is there more than that? And why can't uh, countries such as uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo uh, exit uh, the identity cycle? Is it that those countries are too young or, or what other factors may be? Uh, so any ideas on, on what makes voters uh, 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 act the way they do, I think would be useful. Thank you. Uh, and, and Evelina, if uh, we may start with you. Thank you, Professor Zakin. I was uh, taking notes uh, on your question. Great question. Uh, this is something that uh, we are working on because we are observing the way um, uh, revival success uh, in the uh, abroad uh, Bulgarian community abroad because it is not a new trend in fact if we take a look on the results on the let's say three or five uh, last elections we will see because revival is not a new formation 
it is new uh, to be presented in the parliament, but it has a much longer history in Bulgarian political life, even outside of the parliament. So uh, he invests a lot in flirting with uh, Bulgarians abroad, exactly through the new medias, through the internet uh, and so on. This is why his profile, for example, in Facebook ha uh, have, uh, has more than a million and a half uh, supporters. And uh, it is a very uh, strong platform to communicate his uh, promises. Well, it is. I, I think it is a question and it is a very fruitful um, terrain to be uh, observed why Bulgarians abroad and which Bulgarians abroad support uh, um, a revival because there are differences uh, inside uh, the numbers, uh, different countries with different profiles of the supporters and so on, so on. I will not uh, speculate with this because I think it is a matter of a very uh, huge in-depth uh, observation on terrain. Mm, but could I make one comment, which is uh, based on what I have heard from my colleague and from you? I really appreciate uh, to hear so many points of view and to find the similarities and the differences between the countries on the Balkans. But uh, what I am finding very common and interesting is um, the question of securitization and the mainstreaming of populism, something that in a different way was touched by all of us during our presentation. And I think this is uh, what normalization of populism exactly made. Because uh, as uh, we will all agree that on the discursive level, one of the core characteristic is the question of other others. So the described of otherness and others as enemies. And this is how the entire spectrum of the policies is replacing with the so-called policies of fear, which are, I think, dressed uh, as a more security in different areas of a public spectrum. And uh, this is uh, why we observed how topics that could be explained and treat in terms of uh, human rights, LGBT, migrants, refugees, minorities, and so on, are put in the frame uh, of national security and securitization in, on Balkans, we are talking about bordering, ordering, othering. There is such a, a conception uh, for, for our region. And we, on ground, see it how it's functioning during the so-called uh, long summer of, mig of migration and uh, uh, refugee waves that are going through the Balkans road and the way different countries, even Bulgaria, build borders. And exactly physically, even physically, they were emerged through the question of securitization, which was involved in the debate, thanks to the populist on the Balkans. Thank you very much, Evelina. A question uh, in the chat that mm -hmm. I'll get to in a second, but just to note uh, um, also what you're saying is uh, uh, further reinforces uh, uh, Kas Mude's uh, uh, article on the pathological normalcy. Of course, he wrote it uh, writing about Western Europe, and now we see it throughout the region, which uh, you know uh, begs the question of to what extent we're talking, uh, we can talk about Eastern and Western Europe, communist and post communist. Or are we really talking about a new era of politics where uh, 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 this uh, uh, new uh, media, media and, and social networks, communication instruments render uh, a uh, much different uh, political environment where fragmentation may be the norm. So a question for you, uh, uh, the role of the media, uh, you have mentioned that media instead of combating populism is being used as a platform to spread their populist ideas. How should this situation be addressed? Is there any recommendation to properly tackle the populist misuse of media? And this comes from uh, uh, pa Ivan Escobar Fernandez. Thank you so much for your question. Thank you, Ivan. Yeah, it's a great question, in fact. Uh, it is a personal point of view that uh, the only way to fight with this threat is to answer it with uh, uh, civic activism and uh, check facts. So the only way to fight with uh, uh, the way populists use the new media because they um, are very flexible and mobilize some of the good sides of uh, the new technologies is also for us as an active citizens 
to use the same with the same uh, power. So fact check and uh, uh, truth uh, speaking is the only way I think to fight with them. It is I have even lecture even now after a few minutes with students we will talk ab about uh, e democracy and uh, the way um, some 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 kind, is, is it necessary to regulate the internet somehow to put uh, the same laws as in the physical uh, life uh, to transfer them into the virtual uh, life uh, so it's a very big question and it is not uh, easily to answer but on the european level we all know that uh, they are trying to regulate the way extreme and xenophobes and uh, far right are using uh, these uh, platforms in this space thank you um, uh, uh, apologies that I missed additional questions. Uh, um, a question to all panelists, what are your observations about the nature of populism in the EU member Balkan countries and the non-EU ones? So is there a difference? And a, a question uh, for the Romanian diaspora, though Serena, uh, I think left, but let me read it. Uh, is a, the Romanian diaspora is a complex network of values, attitudes. What brings them together is a very vocal criticism of corrupt political life back home. Part of the people we interviewed voted uh, uh, previously with other anti-establishment party on this ground. They see an AUR the possibility to make Romania a healthy environment to them. Uh, to go back. This uh, was a very interesting insight. It was a very positive image of their future in Romania. If AUR is to uh, wish, uh, uh, is to win elections. So this is from uh, Surina. Um, so as you go, as we go further, perhaps you could also address the EU, non-EU aspect uh, of populism. Um, Nejma. Uh, well, what I can uh, say, and um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, Bosnian experience is very specific because we share so much with the region, uh, not just uh, the culture, the, the, the language, the media landscape, uh, but also the different ethnic groups uh, living across, uh, across the region who also live uh, within Bosnia and Herzegovina. So uh, I think that the example of Croatia is, is really telling um, about, the, um, uh, about the, the type, the blend of uh, populism in the Balkans. Uh, it shows uh, uh, entirely um, uh, the same elements, uh, including, uh, and, and that is probably the only uh, level where, where this change from uh, EU can uh, from non being EU and, and, and being EU appears, which is uh, the sovereignist, the sovereignist populist agenda. So, uh, but also the sovereignist populist agenda is very much present um, uh, with uh, with a different coming from a different background and, and, and inspired mostly by Russia is present in in in, in Serbia. Uh, in Croatia, it is uh, present as a sovereignist fight against Brussels uh, and as a sovereignist agenda uh, against the bureaucrats from Brussels and uh, the far right in Croatia uh, criticizes Croatian prime minister as being uh, the bureaucrat from, from, from Brussels, not, not being genuine in, in protecting an authentic in protecting Croatian interests. Um, so from, from Bosnian perspective, we see no difference. Um, other countries, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, and their experiences are also uh, very valid for, for the entire region, um, express the same type uh, uh, the same type of, let's say, a rejection of Brussels uh, reserves uh, around the rule of law and, 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 and certain values. So that is something, unfortunately, that the right wing groups, uh, even, even the right wing mainstream um, can actually identify, identify with. So that is, uh, that is the type of populism that, that, that seems very close to us. Also with the migrant wave, uh, that uh, caught the entire the entire Balkans. We even had an anti-immigrant uh, uh, rhetoric 
uh, and also including uh, the Bosnian Muslim population in, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, who were also uh, sharing the right wingers, were also sharing the anti uh, immigrant uh, content. Thank you very much. We'll go to Avdi, and then we have two more questions from Martin and from Claudia in the chat. Avdi, you're muted. I think if I may go back just a few words to the first question on mobilizing diaspora. I think in our case, it was quite simple, quite straightforward. Uh, the vocabulary of politics of pluralism has gone too low like for example it has created a perception in diaspora that the country is endangered of thieves then we need to do whatever it takes to save it you know to such a such a banal issues you know and this is what mobilized diaspora probably also uh, based on the fact that uh, they are the one who contribute a lot and probably they think they say that uh, we have enough of contributing and, and we see no progress probably this is a time when a single leader would progress the country and would develop it was very much simplistic very much parsimonious and simplistic taking also into account of not very much uh, not very much uh, plural diaspora, very much uh, diaspora having almost the common common values, mostly linked on family lines. Previously, of course, it was much more ethnic, uh, nationalist oriented during the time of struggle for independence and so on. But now is much more simplistic. Going back to the second question on the difference between populism in the Balkans and the and the uh, European Union countries, I think the case of Kosovo represents a unique case. In the EU, there is no any a party, any populist party who alone rules a country. In no EU member, there is no such a case. So this is quite an, a unique, unique case. We have now a, a sort of a populism established in the mainstream. We as a country, the issue of migrants was not, uh, well, it's not an issue. Not many people cross the country to move to the Western uh, Europe, so mostly populism. So now it's at the mainstream, trying to make the state, uh, to, to, to use the state in a way of uh, trying to control it, probably to save it. But I don't think that in a democracy, a country can save. Uh, uh, in a democracy, one person can save a country. It needs institution, it needs laws, it needs a functional state. I think this is a unique case compared to the European Union uh cases of populism thank you very much uh, advi uh excellent point about the simplistic rhetoric and also the fact that yes the orbans the vucic uh, the yansa and so forth uh, ldv are all uh in, in what is former Eastern Europe. Uh, so quickly, two questions, we're out of time. We can take maybe an additional five minutes uh, if people don't need to go. Uh, a question from Martin, uh, do we have any cases of left-wing populism? Of course, besides uh, Syriza in Greece, uh, do uh, we have left-wing populism in, in, uh, uh, in uh, this region? And second, uh, a question perhaps to Evelina mostly, uh, but also others, uh, how do you measure the soft versus hard populist? So if, anyone from the if, uh, panelists? If I uh, may, if I may, regarding the ideological uh, orientation, it's interesting. Uh, usually political parties, especially in the case in, in the Western Balkans, but mostly in, in the context of, of Kosovo, they are not very much clearly profiled on their ideology you would often see them one day claiming to be left, another day right, and so on. This is the case also in case of the, the Vedvendosia. Initially, of course, due to their ethno-nationalist appeal, they should be considered as a rightist party, even close to an extreme rightist, somehow between rightist and extreme rightist. But now they are a member of social socialists of Europe. So they consider themselves as social uh, democrats. In economic terms, in economic terms, even if you see the policies, they have spent around uh, 
uh, 25% of the, of the country budget in giving uh, uh, assistance to retired people, to students, which were very much criticized because this huge amount of money could have been used for, for example, we are having problems with electricity or with education and so on. So in economic terms, they claim to be like social democrats, but in their political behavior, if they still stick to this ethno-nationalist appeal and so on, which they justify based as a sort of a contextualized ethno-nationalism, as a sort of a defensive nationalism, then it's, it would be very difficult then to bring them within the social democrats. So there is a, this conceptual disparity in terms of the ideological profile uh, they claim. Thank you. Thank you so much. Quickly, Evelina, before she goes on maybe measuring soft yeah. and hard populism. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I was waiting uh, to answer on this question. Thank you, Professor Zankina. Thank you uh, for the question. Uh, so the distinction between soft and hard in our point of view, in the way we use it to make this type of utilization of the uh, political actors in Bulgaria is based on discourse analysis analysis. So soft populism uh, involves those actors that generate general appeals to the people, catch all, let's say, catch all parties and demagogic discourses. Hard populists, uh, on the other hand, they are uh, discursively near to nationalist, extremist, xenophobic, etc, etc. So it's, as I said, it's discursive distinction between uh, uh, populism. Thank you so much. And I would add that also if, often okay. a good test is uh, uh, their uh, attitudes on Europe. So soft populists tend to be very pro-European or at least not anti-European. Um, uh, last words on any of the questions from Nejma before we give uh, uh, the word to our hosts uh, to close the event. Um, well, just to um, uh, support the thesis that um, Avdi presented, uh, there are no clear uh, ideological boundaries um, or, or uh, orientation when it comes to uh, when it comes to political parties in the Balkan. Uh, one of the most um, uh, one of the, the the most extreme parties and one of the most extreme leaders uh, who uses uh, the right wing uh, rhetoric, even uh, civilizationist. Uh, um, uh, rhetoric is Milorad Dodik, uh, whose party uh, is called uh, the Alliance of Independent Social Democrats, and he is entirely uh, uh, far right and pro pro Russian, anti NATO, almost anti uh, uh, with almost anti um, European uh, European agenda, uh, and certainly advocated. Uh, advocating for uh, Christians and Muslims not living together and uh, giving the example of Bosnia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. And he is certainly uh, one of the most uh, prominent uh, genocide and war crimes uh, deniers in, in, in the region. So there is not, uh, but, but the reasons uh, for um, uh, the lack of uh, far left uh, parties um, especially in, in the area of uh, former Yugoslavia is um, twofold. One is uh, that um, there is, while there is uh, a lot of Yugo nostalgia in the air, uh, many leftist ideas are um, uh, uh, immediately dismissed. Uh, as being pro-Yugoslav and being being Yugo nostalgic and being pro-Yugoslav uh, are two different two different things and nobody in our societies wants to uh, appear pro-Yugoslav so there is um, um, uh, I think a far uh, left party in Croatia uh, and they live under uh, extreme pressure because they are called uh, the pro the pro-Yugoslav uh, the pro-Yugoslav leftists. Um, and the other side uh, of, um, uh, of the left-wing uh, political uh, spectrum is actually the pro-Russian leftists uh, uh, whose remains uh, still exist in, in some of the political, political parties in, in Serbia. Very much, uh, Nejma. I would give uh, the word to our host, uh, Azize. 
This has been a wonderful, a wonderful discussion and presentation. And I would like to personally thank for the pleasure to moderate this discussion and for the kind invitation. And to all of you who managed to join us today, Abulent, you have your head up, hand up before Aziza. Thank you so much, uh, dear Emilia, dear distinguished panelists. Thank you very much for these very insightful presentations. Uh, and Emilia for your great moderating. Dear attendees, you enriched the panel with your questions and remarks. Please mark your calendars for the next session, which will take place on 27th of November. Uh, we will discuss populism in Benelux countries and Switzerland. I wish you all a great rest of the day. Thank you, everyone.